Good evening. Let's all stand. Good to see you tonight. Turn into your blue hymnal, 363. 363. say it every time, but uh, I promise you now. Turn your Bibles to begin with to Acts chapter 10. If you're taking notes tonight, I'm just going to give you a lot of, uh, uh, give you a little <clears throat> word to and then some scripture to go with it, and, and uh, you can do this self-study at home. It'll be a great blessing to you. And what a blessing to be a Christian. <clears throat> what a blessing to be a child of the living God. What a blessing to be born again, washed by the blood, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, sealed for eternity, and on the road to heaven. No matter what the world will do to you or what the devil does to you, what kind of tragedies come your way, Take your health, your strength, but they can't take your soul. It's sealed and secure tonight. And I just is gleaming on this, and uh, <clears throat> Pastor asked me Sunday to <clears throat> speak tonight. I said, you got something up your sleeve? I said, I thought, well, no, but I can get something up my sleeve real quick, I guess. <clears throat> I said, when you need me? He said, when it's night. I said, okay. So a lot of things I could have spoke on tonight. Uh, I've got a lot of sermon outlines and working on one now. Boy, it's exciting on, on James. But uh, I said I'm going to be easy on them tonight. And uh, people's tired on Wednesday. And I 
told uh, Bill back there to make it short because everybody's eating barbecue and probably got the heartburn. And uh, so uh, we'll get you out here. Anyway, <clears throat> what a blessing to be a Christian. I wish I'd have brought my reading glasses. I forgot them. But uh, in Acts chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 43, and uh, I find it there. There it is. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him should receive remissions of sin. Did I get that right? Yes. Oh, I wish I brought my glasses. But uh, <clears throat> so the first thing is about a blessing for a Christian uh, is uh, they're forgiven. And, you know, sometimes you battle with that. I don't know if y'all did or not. When I got saved, I, you know, I, I struggled for a while. I battled, you know, <clears throat> of all the things said, done, thought, you know, over the years, and and uh, I battled. I <clears throat> I got saved in a in uh, in an independent Baptist church. You've heard me tell that many times. Then uh, when we come to Tennessee, moved back over here, <clears throat> we got in a uh, a Free Will Baptist church. Who are the good people? <clears throat> they hold the Arminian view, believe you can be saved and then lose your salvation, and be saved again. And and uh, I've had them tell me, you know, I got resaved. Uh, I've been resaved twice, and so <clears throat> there was a lot of confusion in my life, you know. And uh, I remember laying down for night in bed, and I'd say, Lord, if I've lost my salvation day, I pray you'll save me again. I don't know how many times I said that, you know. And, uh, and until I, and I remember a guy telling me one time, he was a free will Baptist, and we were in National Guard together, and I was just, I hadn't been saved long, and he said, he said, you know them <clears throat> independent Baptists, and at that time I was going to independent Baptists, so that's where we got saved at, and was still over in Duffield. And uh, he said, they believe you can, you can get saved, and you just live anyway, and go to heaven. And I said, ah, and I didn't know. I said, why? Well, they don't believe that, surely. And I uh, had a guy tell me one time, he said, if I believed that, that you could never be lost, he said, I, he said I'd go out here and I, I'd get me a, a six-pack of beer and a, and a pretty woman. But that time, when he told me that, I had advanced quite a bit in knowledge, and I said, no, I said, if you believe that, I said, you wouldn't want to get a six-pack of beer and a pretty woman. And uh, I said, because God, he, he fixes that problem with you real quick. So we're forgiven in Romans 10, 9, and 10, which, are, you know, you know that. That's the uh, Romans road, you know, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13 says, And for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And uh, it's a clear indication of these things. And Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. That eliminates all works right there. It's by grace, not work. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. And uh, our salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. Nothing added. God's mercy. And that's what saved us. It is God that convicts us by the Holy Spirit when we're lost. If you're sitting, if you got saved in church, somebody preaching, uh, and the Holy Spirit convicted you that you was lost and on the road to hell. If somebody come to your house and witness to you, and read the word of God to you and told you it's lost. It was the Holy Spirit that convicted you of sin and your need for a Savior. So God, God, uh, he convicts us, he draws us, and he saves us. And we ain't got nothing to do with it. And people say, well now, faith. I had faith. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God even gives us the faith to be saved. When he convicts us of our sin and we're under conviction, then God gives us that faith. Now, do we have a choice? Yeah. You can say no. 
but there are dire consequences to it. And so God does everything. We're not capable of doing anything. We just believe, and he gives us that faith to believe. <coughs> Ephesians 1, uh, 7 there, if you're taking notes, <coughs> God paid the required ransom for our soul. God demanded that blood sacrifice, that pure lamb to be sacrificed. In the Old Testament, they sacrificed the lambs and the sheep and the goats and the red heifers. They sacrificed these, that blood, and they, and they sprinkled that blood. Once a year, the great high priest go into the holies of holies and take the blood of the red heifer and go in there, and he would sprinkle that in there on the altar. And then he'd come out, and he did that for the whole nation of Israel every year, once a year. He did that. When Jesus died on Calvary and shed his blood, that abolished all of that. That was the last sacrifice that was accepted. Matter of fact, which I've got down here in my notes, when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, <clears throat> the Bible said in three places in the gospel that the veil that covered the holies of holies rent from the top to the bottom and opened up. There'd be no more sacrifice. That last sacrifice was offered when his blood was shed. The blood to cover every sin that was ever committed in the entire world on every person. His blood was sufficient to cover every man's sins and when he shed it there. So they're forgiven. Another thing about a Christian they, they are justified. Acts 13, 39 says we're justified. That's complete forgiveness. We're justified before God when we're washed in the blood of Christ. Just as, our, just as if we'd never sinned, our, we're cleansed and washed white as snow there. Romans 3, 24 says we're pardoned from the guilt and the penalty of sin. He cleanses us from that. It is by faith, not works of any kind. Galatians 2.16, Galatians 3.11, Philippians 3.9. We're cleansed there on justification. The next thing, the blessings of a Christian is they are a new creation when we get saved. We're brand new. You can't explain it, what happened. I couldn't explain what happened to me that day, but I knew something happened. And I knew when, when I got up off of that pew in that church, right there, I was sitting in the center pew. I got off of that pew. Before I got to the altar, God had already saved me. I couldn't tell you nothing that preacher said. The pastor of the church was the one that dealt with me. I couldn't tell you nothing he said. By the time I got from that seat, when I got up and made that step and got there, I was already saved. God had changed my life forever. And... Uh, we're a new creature. There'll be a change in a person when he comes to Christ. Uh, when God saves somebody, you're a new creature. The Bible says there in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. Most of you probably know that verse by heart. The Bible says, Therefore, what he had just previously said, he said, because of what I've just said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The King James says creature, the original word in the Greek is creation. He's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If you're a brand new person, brand new creation, starting out in a brand new life, don't know, don't know what's going on, I didn't. But I knew something had happened. So we're a new creation. Another thing they are, when we come to Jesus and get saved, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. I covered that a little there in the introduction there. Great importance to know that. And uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. The Bible gives us a little insight there. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 13, the Bible says, In whom you have trusted, <clears throat> after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, after that ye believed, 
you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When you trusted God, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. There was a time or two as I was growing a little that I thought I'd lost my salvation. I remember I told you all this over at the National Guard one day. He was in there, and I was welding something. One of my buddies came along and kicked him, and it flew apart. Of course, it looked like a chicken hatched on it anyway. I mean, it wouldn't have helped. But, uh, and I, I cussed him when he did that. Use God's name in vain. I'll never forget. And boy, I felt like somebody stabbed me in the heart. And I went out behind the shop and sat down out there and cried. I'll never forget it. And I said, God, I'm sorry. I said, uh, I lasted a little while, but not long. And I said, I'm sorry. So uh, I found out I was wrong. And uh, so that's what happened. We're sealed. Ephesians 4.30 there's a good verse. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. We're sealed by God. We're, we become His property. We become His sons and daughters. We become heirs to His inheritance, brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> so we're sealed there. 1 Corinthians 121 uses the word established. It places, the word established places a person on a firm foundation. John 10, 28 and 29, the Bible talks about there that uh, Jesus said we couldn't be lost. No man could take us away. We're in the Father's hand and nobody could take us out of the Father's hand. We're sealed by the Spirit of God. Evil and sin are still present. Can I get a apply on that? Evil, evil and sin still present in your life? Yeah, it's still present. And, uh, but the believer sees them in a new perspective once he gets saved. And uh, Also, we're not only sealed by the Holy Spirit, but we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 tells us that we're the temple of the living God. Paul tells us there in, in 1 Corinthians 6 that the Holy Spirit takes residence in us when we get saved there. John tells us over in the Gospel of John there that Jesus was telling them in chapter 14, he said, I go away, but I send a comforter. When he has come, he will teach you and guide you in all things. And the comforter, he said, he'll not only be with you, but he will be in you. So when a person comes to Christ and gets saved, at that second, the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, takes a boat up in your body. He's inside you right now if you're saved. And uh, he'll be there until you either die physically or till you're raptured out, if you're still living when the rapture takes place. But he's there and he lives within us. That's why when, when we do wrong, say something we shouldn't say, think something we shouldn't think, do something we shouldn't do, you can feel that, can't you? That, that guilt. God putting pressure on us, the Holy Spirit. That's a temple. This temple belongs to Him. He owns this body. And a temple is something that we actually ought to take care of. Ought to keep clean, take care of it, you know. This is our sanctuary here. What if nobody ever cleaned it up? What if you come in here and you had to knock papers off your pew to sit down? Kick stuff out of the floor, get it out of the way. Pastors had to walk up here and trip over stuff laying up here. We take care of it, don't we? <clears throat> we take care of the house of God. You are the house of God. And the Holy Spirit lives with inside you. So we're the temple there. Our bodies are the temple. The temple is a place of worship. The next thing is we're delivered from condemnation. <clears throat> the Bible tells us over in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you,
life. I cannot read my Bible. But the word, the, he that believeth on them that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. When you trust Christ, there's no more condemnation on you. You're passed from death to life. And uh, that's a promise of a Christian there. Romans 5, 16 and verse 18 says that. Romans <clears throat> chapter 8, it's a great chapter, begins in Christ and ends in Christ. Therefore, there is therefore now no, no, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's no condemnation in a child of the living God. No sin a believer can commit, past, present, or future, can be held against him since the penalty was paid by Christ. No sin there. Now, I would say there, there's consequences to our sins. When we sin, every time we sin, the Holy Spirit will convict you every time you sin. And when, when he convicts us, immediately we repent of that. And turn from it. And if we don't, there's consequences to that sin. And uh, that's why we get chastised. The next thing a believer has is we're given peace. And John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says, I give unto you peace. Not as the world gives you peace, but he gives us peace. That peace that passes all understanding. When something tragic happens, we have that peace of God. I've been to uh, to many funerals. I was telling somebody the other day, I can't remember who it was, <clears throat> and uh, I was out visiting, I can't remember who I told, but we were talking about funerals and stuff, and talking about the peace of God. I said, when a, when a Christian loses a loved one, it's heartbreaking. I mean, your heart's just as broke as anybody. You cry, you weep, you hurt. But if that loved one's saved, you got peace. I've been to funerals where I've seen them try to drag them out of the coffin. They had no peace. I've been trying to pull them out of the casket. Had no peace. So God gives us a peace. He gives us a peace to face the things that come our way. He gives us a peace to... Um, to stand up to hard things that happen in our family or job or whatever. It gives us that peace that nobody else can give. And when, when something happens with that peace, when we trust God, we'll find ourselves crying out to God. We'll do that. I remember May the 19th this year on a Sunday evening, <clears throat> and I was sitting out there in the corner of the woods where I generally go and sit of the evening, Alan come out there and holler. Said, Mama's failed. And, uh, and he said, she's, she's failed in the shower. I heard him say that. And he said, she's had a stroke. I heard him say that. And that's a pretty good walk from where I was at. But I remember when I was heading towards the house. Ask you, please. And all the way to the house. The time I got to the house, I had peace. I just did what I needed to do then, and the EMS got there and did what they needed to do, and, and uh, you see the results. And uh, just had the peace of God. Now, it it could have went the other way, but I still believe God would give me that peace that I would have needed at that time. So God gives us a comfort, a peace, when things are just coming apart around us. We can have that peace. <clears throat> and uh, he blesses her. That's a great, great joy there. It dissolves all fears, Philippians 4, 7 tells us. Psalms 23, you know that one, the 23rd Psalms, where David had the peace there. It rules in the heart of God's people in harmony, Colossians 3.15. We once were enemies at war with God, 
but now, but that's ended forever now by its reconciliation in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, 11. And uh, prior to being saved, we were at war with God. We were lost without Christ on the road to hell. God rejected us, and he saved us. The next thing is that, that uh, they have is, is that we become a child of God. In Roman or in John chapter one, the Bible tells us there, early in John chapter one there, that uh, he said, uh, he came into his own, verse 11, and his own received him not, verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And which were born not of the blood, nor of the will of man, nor of the flesh, but of God. And we became the sons of the living God and daughters of the living God there. To receive him who is the word of God is to receive, is to be received by God as his children. When we receive Christ, who's the Word of God. The Bible said in John there in the first chapter, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what was the Word? The Word was God. And you go on down, it says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word of God. And those that believe in the Word of God become children of God. So God loves, his love for his children initiated their salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. And Christ's return will unite the believers with their heavenly Father. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. He said, if I go away, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also with me. And he said, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He told his disciples that, speaking to us. We also become heirs of God. And you know what an heir is? It's, it's somebody's left in a wheel. You're an heir of somebody. They put your name in their wheel. And then when, when that person uh, dies, then that wheel is opened and you see what's there. You become an heir of that person. Galatians 3.29 said we're heirs and joint heirs with God. Galatians 4.7 talks about us being heirs of the living God. Because believers are God's children, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. And Ephesians 1.11 tells us about that. Colossians 1.12 and Colossians 3.24 tells us these things about being heirs. We're also blessed with all spiritual blessings. In Ephesians 1.3, the Bible tells us there, Paul said that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings as a child of the living God. Blessed here is the same meaning in Ephesians 1.3 as the Greek word eulogy. And you know what a eulogy is? Somebody stands up at a funeral and they give a eulogy, they uh, say a bunch of nice things about somebody. And... Uh, it means, the word eulogy means praise and commend. And that word uh, blessed there is the same Greek word as eulogy. And that's what it means. Matthew 5, verse 2 through 12, blessed are those who obey God's word. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 said, blessed are those that obey. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, God's word. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. And his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So that's a great promise in that blessing. Also, uh, the Christian is blessed and they're given access to God through prayer. Do you know the Old Testament people, the, they had to go to the priest. They confessed their sins. Uh, they would give an offering. The priest would make the blood offering for their sins. 
and the priests would do the pray at that time. Under the New Testament there, as I mentioned earlier there when we first begun, in Matthew 27, 51, Mark 15, uh, 37, 38, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent from the top to the bottom of the temple. Every believer from that point on had access to God through prayer. Now you think every time you pray, it ought to be every day and several times a day, that when you pray, bow your head and pray, you're talking to the living God, the God that created this universe and spoke it into this. You're not only talking to him, but he hears what you say. Matter of fact, he knows what you're going to say before you say it. And we're able to do that. <clears throat> now, a lot of the heathens and people, that they pray to statues and to the moon and the sun and the stars, to rocks, to the ocean, to the earth. But we pray to the God that created all this stuff. He made it all. And we can pray and talk to him because we are his children, born again by the blood of his son Jesus who died at Calvary for our sins. We have that privilege. And it's a great, blessed privilege. Do we deserve it? No. Did we earn it? No. By God's mercy and grace, we can do that. Hebrews 10, 19 and through 22, the way was open for us to do this, this access. It tells us in Hebrews are by the blood of Jesus. It opened that way for us to be able to do that. And the last thing here is as a Christian, the, we have the blessings and the privilege to be chastised by God. You ever been chastised by the Lord? The old people you say you ever been took to the woodshed and uh, got a chastisement. Chastisement begins when we first sin. <clears throat> it begins by by guilt. We realize we've done something wrong, said something wrong, thought something wrong, and that's where it begins. And God's given us an opportunity at that moment to repent of this and bring it before him and get it took care of. If we do not, and there's been times I did not, and there's been times I would say every one of you has not, then the chastisement gets more severe. We try to sweep it under the rug. We try to cover it some way, but it gets more severe. People will you do wrong and you you know and you don't make it right with them or half right uh, if you beat them out of two hundred dollars and finally one day you give them a hundred you think it's okay you still owe them a hundred but God don't give up people like I heard an old preacher say one time it's like putting your head in a vice kind of crank her down to smashing your ears you can't get out. It's just tight enough that you can't get out. And he comes in there and you don't <clears throat> give up. He just turns her another crank. And he turns her another crank and another. And if you don't give up before long, your head's going to pop like a watermelon. And God just keeps on keeping on. He don't give up. He don't let it. He don't say, I, I just forget it. <clears throat> Puts pressure down. Till we repent of the sin. Not confess the sin. Confess it is admitting I've done wrong. The Lord, I've done wrong. Repent is that I've not only done wrong, I ask you to forgive me for it, and I'm turning away from it. That's what repent means. And then God wipes the slate clean. If we don't, the pressure just keeps coming, keeps coming, keeps coming. And uh, these people that suffer greatly, God's children, because they would not repent of something they'd done wrong. And uh, the best way around that, and the best way through it, is to avoid it, start with. 
We know when we're about to do something wrong. We know when we're tempted to lie, to cheat, to adjust some figures in a certain way. We know that. We're not dumb. And when we know that, we're, I probably ought not do this. I die gone, everybody else does. We know better than that. And God's telling us right then, don't do this. Don't do it. So, you know, and then chastisement comes. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, talks about God's chastising. <clears throat> the Bible said he chastens every son he receiveth and every daughter. It says, he that sinneth and is without chastisement. The King James Version said he is a bastard, not a son. The original says he's illegitimate. God said, don't belong to me. If you can sin and get by with it, and it don't bother you, you need to get saved. Because you, you've been dealt a foolish hand somewhere along the line. Because God will chastise you and convict you every single time you sin. Mark it down. Why does he chastise us? tells us there in Hebrews. Because he loves us. The Bible, it even goes on to say there, fathers of the flesh, which is our dad, grandpas, and all that, they chastise us. Sometimes just for their pleasure. They just give you a whooping because you had not had one in a week. Well, they just give you one. I've been whooped with backer sticks. I had to cut my own switches when I was growing up. And I tried to cut one that was easy to break. And they just do it for pleasure sometimes. But God, the Bible says, God does it for our own benefit, for our profiting. He corrects you so you won't do it again. And that's because he loves us and that's because of his mercy that he has upon us. Do we not have a wonderful God or not? A wonderful God. Loves us beyond anything our minds are able to comprehend how much God loves us. And one day, one day, when we leave this world and get a glorified body and be able to walk into the presence of God and give him the praise and the honor that he deserves because we will be in a sinless, glorified body <clears throat> with a mind that God's give us to know all things. And we can give him the praise and honor that he deserves. <clears throat> Amen? Amen. That's my story tonight, and I'm sticking to it. And I hope you wrote a lot of this down. Take it home, read it. If I said something wrong, tell me about it Sunday. We'll correct it. All right? Everybody's watching on uh, live stream tonight or maybe YouTube, looking at it later on. Thank you for coming this way, and I pray it be a blessing to you. And uh, uh, Jim, go ahead and cut me off there. So I thank you all for coming, and uh, it's a good crowd for Wednesday night. <clears throat> Pray the Lord bless you, give you a safe trip home. Tell me when I'm off, Jim. I'm off. Uh, Christy, how's Gordon doing?